and good morning, Mount Olive. It's so good to be here with you this morning. We're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, if there's any guests here today, we want you to take the flap of your bulls and fill that out, put in the offering plate in just a minute. Um, we have so uh, a few announcements, a couple of them not in the bulletin, so please pay attention this morning. Uh, a couple that are Brotherhood and WMU next week, so be be here for that. We're going to have a, a, a breakfast like normal next week, getting back on schedule. Uh, youth camp is coming up June the 13th through the 17th, and that money is due now. So if, if you can finish paying your account off on that, let it get, get to me as soon as you can. Uh, we need to make a payment on that very soon. Uh, next, in two weeks from today, we'll be having our baccalaureate service. We'll be recognizing our seniors from high school, and uh, we want to let you know about that. Uh, that will be uh, May the 14th, and uh, next Sunday in the bulletin, we plan on having a, a list of all of our seniors published in here, so you'll know who they are and their names and stuff. So um, we'll just let you know this morning it's going to be on May the 14th. Also, at the end of service today, we're going to have a, a love offering. We told you about it last week for Steve Roberts. He's taking a mission trip to Madagascar and uh, first week of June. And we're going to take a love offering this morning at the end of service um, for him to help him with those mission trip expenses. So please, I'll please ask you to give on that. Um, also, uh, tonight is our today is our fifth Sunday of the month, and uh, we normally have a fifth Sunday night singing. Um, so the good, uh, let, me, let me say, get this right. So Jacob told me to get this right now. Uh, so the good news is, no, the bad news is, is we we we're, we're not having. The singing tonight. The good news is we don't have spaghetti for you, okay? So <laughs> that's what he said. Now, I like the spaghetti. I like the barbecue and the chicken and everything, but that's what he said. I really like the homemade ice cream. I ain't going to lie. But, uh, but anyway, I don't, we are, we are going to have normal services tonight, and we do ask you to be weather conscious this afternoon, too. Um, there could be some weather coming, so y'all do be careful. Let's bow for a word of prayer now. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, y'all, y'all heard that. Forty-one hundred dollars for Annie Armstrong. So that was well above our goal, and we were so excited about that. And that that money um, does a. I, I've had friends of mine who have been directly impacted on um, with that money that we give to Annie Armstrong and uh, and, and in and their ministries um, across the um, and what they've been doing, planting churches and those kind of things. So anyway, let's bow for a word of prayer now. Uh, Father God, we just thank you so much for this day. Uh, God, we thank you so much for what you've done in our church and in our midst over the past um, few weeks. Um, God, we look forward to what you have in store for us. God, I pray as a church that we are um, desiring to bring glory and honor to you today. Uh, God, I pray that it's not about ourselves. It's not about our um, what we want. It's not This morning is not about um, us being seen or heard, God. But this morning is about you being lifted up. Um, you being worshipped, us hearing from you. Um, God, I pray that we are ready to respond today. Uh, God, I thank you so much for what we've had with our meetings this past week with Revival, God. Um, it was so refreshing. And God, we just look forward to what you have for us in the near future. We look forward to what you do in our midst, God. We want to be about your business. And God, I pray that you help us to uh, to be disciplined in our, in our study and devotion to you, God. Help us to be disciplined in, in what we are doing in our daily lives as we minister to other people. And, God, I pray for those in our church and those in our community that are not, that are not saved, that are lost. And God, I pray that you help us to be um, that Bible that they see. Help us as Christians to be there for them. Help us to show them the love of Christ, God, every day. Help us, God, to, to be there for them. And we pray that those in our community, those even in our church this morning that don't know you as Savior and Lord, will come to know you as Savior and Lord before it's too late. Even today, God, may it happen today. God, thank you for this day. I thank you again for all the things you've done for us. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Y'all stand up. Let's have a time of fellowship, please.
Amen. As you're coming back to your seats, I do have one other uh, card I need to read. Uh, this is from Jessica, uh, Benjamin, Austin, Ray, and Austin, Bryson, the Ty Bryson and Tyler. It says, we would like to say thank you for all your help during this difficult time. Uh, we're greatly thankful for everything and their, and their loss. So continue to pray for them as they're uh, starting over with their home. So. Uh, yeah, the, the the spaghetti. I love spaghetti, Brother Forrest. If any of y'all have ever been on a mission trip to Chester Chisholm, uh, I tell you what, if you don't eat it all one day, you're going to see it the next day. So, it, <laughs> But spaghetti is always better the next day, so we're, we're thankful for that. I told someone after the revival, I said, you know, my, my cup runneth over. I know we were, we were full of, 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 of food, but we were also spiritually full as well. And today, uh, as we sing, uh, we, I just want to praise God for the blessings that he has sent our way. Um, and I know a lot of people did a lot of things here at Mount Olive and put forth the extra mile. But, uh, but also, God, God showed up too. And we're so thankful for him and Brother Forrest and Brother Royce for what they've done. So let's sing, let's sing praises to God this morning. Uh, and thank him for, for this revival that we've had and look forward to continue to serve him. We're going to sing page 10, How Great Thou Art.
sing page four. To God be the glory. We'll sing the first, second, and third verses. <laughs> page 243, Sweet, Sweet Spirit.
little book of James is over near the end of the New Testament. You know where it is. Would you turn there with me this morning as we look together at James, the second chapter, and I want to read this morning verses 14 through 26. James chapter 2. Go ahead and stand with me if you will. It's a lengthy passage of scripture, but I want you to get the thrust of the scripture that I want to share with you today, and it will take that many verses to, uh, to do that, all right? James chapter 2, verse 14. You remember now, James uh, technically is the half-brother of our Lord Jesus. This is the James that grew up, same home, same parents as the Lord Jesus. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In other words, what good is his faith if he says he has faith in Jesus? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons in hell believe that and shudder or tremble. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that he ha- you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was not made complete, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he called God his, God, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, and that's what we call death, it's when the spirit leaves the body, then he makes this comparison. Even so faith without deeds is dead. Now, thank you, and you be seated at this time, please. I dare say that every person here today, every person who's ever lived, perhaps, has his own special problems in life. And I know that you think the life of pastors and preachers is perfect, that it's uh, problemless, but it's not. I heard about a certain preacher who, when he would stand before his congregation to preach on Sunday morning, he had an older gentleman in the church who would almost always doze off during his sermon. I've said to you before, I'll say it again, there's nothing that breaks the heart of a preacher more than somebody going to sleep while he's preaching. And so he finally decided that he was going to get even with this guy, this layman in his church, and he devised this little plan, young people. He came up with this idea, and here's what he did. He was preaching along one Sunday morning, and the older gentleman was beginning to doze a little bit. His eyelids were going to go go falling asleep and that kind of thing. And the preacher came to a certain place in his sermon where he said, How many of you want to die and go to hell? And he said it real loud, just like I just said it. And then he quietened his voice down and he said, stand up. And all of a sudden, everybody stayed seated, but the man who was sort of in and out of it, he heard those words sort of in his his sleep, and he stood up as fast as he could. He turned around, he looked around, he saw nobody else standing up, and he simply said to the preacher, he said, preacher, I don't know what we're voting on this morning, but it looks like you and I are the only two for it. Well, he had his problems. And I want to say to you this morning that James, the writer of this little epistle, had his problems as well. Even 2,000 years ago, writing scripture, 
James is here dealing with a problem in the church. And when you begin to see and understand what James is writing about, he's writing about grace and works. He's writing about how to be saved and how grace and works, grace and deeds, how do they come together? James is dealing with a theological issue as he writes this passage of Scripture. And when you begin to study this passage and you begin to study passages that the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament as well, what you come away saying is a lot of people come away saying, well, there's a contradiction between what Paul wrote about salvation and how to be saved and faith and what James wrote about salvation and how to be saved. Because James is here saying that, that for, it to be, for it to be real faith, faith must be accompanied by works, by deeds of righteousness, deeds of goodness. Now you study the Apostle Paul, especially the books of Romans and, the, and, and Galatians, and what you, dare, what you discover is that very quickly Paul says there over and over and over again that we're not saved by our deeds of righteousness, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and that alone. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 stand as those two verses of scriptures that, Pat, that Baptists have stood on in our theology about salvation forever. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so you come away thinking, which one of these two men is right? Is Paul right or is James right? Well, I want to give an answer to that because I have an answer, okay? And here's the answer. Both of them are right. What you need to understand about these, these thoughts and about what James writes about and what Paul writes about is that you understand that they are writing to two different groups of people for two different purposes. Paul writes about salvation and grace and works, deeds of goodness. He writes about it as a, as a, a theology of salvation. And he says the only way any of us are ever saved is by repenting of our sins and putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and his shed blood, the work of the cross, in that and in that alone. That's the only way we can ever be saved. And I want to tell you that was a traumatic message in that day and time, preaching salvation by grace through faith alone without deeds of goodness and deeds of righteousness and obeying the laws, the commands of Moses, I'm telling you, that was a big deal. And that was a great variation from what Jews had been hearing all of their lives. And yet Paul says that salvation is totally, completely, freely through Jesus Christ. Now, James comes along and James is writing to, to people in the church. Who, have, who seemingly may have strayed in their thinking from the, from the truth. He may have been talking to, to hypocritical Christians. He may have been talking to, to Jews who certainly who had gotten saved, come into the church, and they still had this background of thinking the only way you can be saved is by obeying the law step by step, commandment by commandment. That's the only way. James is saying here, that's, that's not the way it is. Faith. He's talking about faith, and he's talking about what real faith is. James is pointing out to us that there is a living faith by which we live as Christians, and there is a dead faith. There is a superficial kind of faith. Now the question is, is what is real faith? We know that without faith we cannot please God, so real faith is what it takes to please God. God. Now, what I want you to see here is that there are two kinds of justification. Two kinds of justification. We are justified before God through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's called salvation justification. And God sees us just as if we have never sinned when we put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is also a justification, another kind, a justification of 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 our faith, a, an authentication of our faith. You see, God can look at my heart and God can look at your heart 
and he can know whether or you are genuine and sincere and you're really putting your trust in him because he can look at our hearts. He knows what we are thinking in our hearts. But the truth is, you can't look into my heart and I can't look into your heart and know that for sure. I don't have that ability. You don't have that ability. So how do you know that I have real genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, that's what James is talking about here. He's talking about the kind of faith that produces itself in good works, in deeds of righteousness, in all kinds of doing things that honor God. Works, deeds, actions that authenticate and evidence and prove that we have real faith. The only way you can know that I have real faith in Jesus is my behavior, my example, how I live, what I do in my life, what I say in my life, how I act, how I behave in my life. You can fruit pick other people's lives in that sense, and that authenticates real faith. God has to authenticate my salvation faith Only we, only you can look at me and tell whether or not I really am a child of God by my actions. You see, Paul is talking here about a no-so kind of salvation. James is talking about a show-so kind of salvation. Paul is talking about the means of our salvation. James is talking about the marks of our salvation. James is not saying that we are not saved by faith alone. James is saying that if you really are saved, your faith will never be alone. There will be deeds and actions of service, of righteousness that authenticate that real faith. Paul here, dear friend, is talking about the root of salvation. James is talking about the fruit of salvation. James is talking about faith that can never save. Look at what verse 14 says when he asks that question once again. Can that kind of faith, can that kind of faith save anyone? Faith that has absolutely no life in it, faith that has absolutely no service in it, faith that is, in James's opinion, it is dead faith, it is superficial faith, it is a spurious kind of faith. I want to tell you, it's good for any and all of us to examine our faith. And whether or not we really have sincere, genuine, true faith in our lives. And while James is talking here about about false faith, he gives us three examples, or he gives us three views about what real dead faith is. There are three pictures he gives us of dead faith. And so if you're taking notes this morning, here's what I want you to write down. The title of this message is very simple. Faith that does not save. Faith that cannot save. And James says here that picture number one is this. A faith that does not save is a faith that has confession without compassion. Confession without compassion compassion. And just simply write down verses 15, 16, and 17. And I'm going to give you that illustration in just a moment. Why is this kind of faith, confession without compassion, a dead kind of faith? Simply because, listen folks, it is a confession made with the mouth without a compassion in the heart. And a confession, simple confession of faith in Jesus with the mouth, but without compassion in the heart of that person, I'm telling you, it is a dead faith, it's a spurious faith, it's a false faith, and it will not get you or anyone else to heaven. James here uses an illustration of a poor person who comes into the church, who has all kinds of physical needs in his life, And the church basically says to him, be well fed, be well thought of, good for you, God's going to take care of you, God bless you, and they send him on his way. And they do not meet those physical needs of any kind. James says that is a confession of faith in Jesus, but that's no compassion, which is just the opposite of the way Jesus is in the heart. 
Well, let me, let me contemporize. Let me contemporize that illustration. Well, let's just say, for instance, uh, Jacob back here, our um, music director and a veterinarian. Let's just say, for instance, that uh, his business goes bankrupt. And with three daughters to buy for, I could understand that. Okay? Those, he, you haven't bought those prom dresses yet, have you, Jacob? You will. And let's say he comes to my house at 2625 Green Ridge Drive, Belden, Mississippi, and he knocks on my door, and it's a pretty cold winter evening. And he comes in, and I say, oh, Jacob, come on in, man. Have a seat. Sit down here in my living room. Got a fire going over there. I mean, it's just nice and warm, and I've been having some popcorn and Coca-Cola. And, and, and he, says, he says, oh, Brother Forrest, I'm up against it. I'm really having a hard time. I said, well, yeah, man, I, I, I knew you back when you were at Mount Olive Baptist Church. I knew you back there when you had that good jam. Oh, he says, it's gone on the rocks and I don't have anything. I, and I say to something like him, well, God bless you, Jacob. I just know things are going to t- turn around for you. I know God's going to be with you. God is going to take care of you. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I'm going to say to him, Jacob, be still, be warmed, be blessed, and be gone. Now, do you think that's how a Christian should act? Do you think that's what real faith is when he or she sees a brother, a sister in need? I'm just telling you folks, that's not what real faith is. That's That's a picture of a person who has no faith because he doesn't extend a helping hand to his brother or to his sister, to the family who has a need. It is so easy, listen, it is so easy to say, I have faith in Jesus. I don't find very many people in northeast Mississippi who who will say that. I'm telling you, it's altogether a different situation. It's easy to confess Jesus Christ. It's a whole different deal to have compassion in the heart for brothers, sisters, anyone inside the faith, anyone outside the faith. You see, if you have a real confession of Jesus and it's genuine and there's true faith in one's heart, I'm just saying to you that there will be a compassion that will be seen and demonstrated and visualized. It will be an expression of one's love for Jesus. You cannot be the same when Jesus comes into your heart. I'm telling you, you, you go out here and you get a hold of a 220 volt electrical line, you cannot be the same. It will change you. You'll look like that old boxing boxer promoter from years gone by, Don King. How many of you remember Don King? <laughs> His hair looked like he was holding an electrical line all the time, didn't it? You can't stay the same. You will be different for real faith in Jesus to be a part of your life. And it will always express itself in compassion. But James says here, secondly, a faith that cannot save is pictured not only as a simple confession in Jesus without compassion, but he says, secondly, it is pictured as belief without behavior. Belief without behavior. And here in verses 18 and 19, James describes a faith that is belief without, you you know what I'm saying, a behavioral change in the life of a person who claims to be a Christian. You say you believe in God, but you don't have any change in your behavior in your life. And I'm telling you, I know people like that. I know people who've walked and I know people who've gone through all the the steps of becoming a Christian. And and they believe. And they and they have maybe some strong beliefs. Even to the point that they believe and tremble. Now a lot of a lot of Baptists have that kind of belief. I mean, James says here that just mere belief and mere mental assent to certain beliefs in the Bible 
does not make you into a Christian. And it does not mean that you have genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Belief without behavioral change in a person's life is nothing but a dead, false, spurious faith that will not save. If it does not change you or me from the inside out about how we see things and how we view things and how we, how we live in our lives, how we live our lives, I dare say it's mere mental belief, but it's certainly without a change in lifestyle. It's easy to say, listen, I'm a Baptist, or I believe. That doesn't make you a Christian. Even the devils in hell believe, the Bible says. Even they believe. I heard the story on one occasion about it took place in the Old West. <laughs> and uh, uh, this thief, robber, was robbing a group of people. And he had them all lined up and was taking all their rings and necklaces and goods from them. And he came to one man who was a Baptist preacher. And the Baptist preacher said, said, oh, sir, he said, please don't take what I have. Please don't take my money. I don't have anything worth hardly anything at all. He said, I'm, I'm just a poor old Baptist preacher. And the thief looked at him, and the thief and the robber said to him, you're a Baptist? And the Baptist preacher said, yes, sir, I am. And the thief extended his hand like that and said, put it there, brother. I'm a Baptist too. Let's shake on it. And you can be a Baptist. I hear tell there's a lot of Baptists in prisons today in Mississippi and Oklahoma and Texas and anywhere else. Just to mere, merely believe some theological or historical facts about Jesus Christ makes you no better than, than the demons of hell. You see, if you were to bring a demon in here and, and you could actually... Uh, interview a demon up here on this platform and if you could ask him certain theological questions you would be amazed as to what he would believe about God the Bible and Jesus Christ if you were to ask him a question like this okay Mr. Demon do you believe that Jesus is the son of God and he would say sure turn in the Bible to Matthew 8 chapter 8 verse 29 and you'll read that verse of scripture where it simply says that the demon recognized Jesus as the Son of God. What have I to do with thee, thou Son of God? The demon asked Jesus in that verse of scripture. If you were to ask the demon, do you believe Jesus died at Calvary? He would say, yes, sir, I do believe that Jesus died at Calvary. I was right there and I watched the whole thing. Ask him, do you believe that he is coming again? And he would say, oh, yes. The demons say, I believe he's coming again without any problem whatsoever. Do you believe in and are you willing to, to be baptized, Mr. Demon? And the demons say, oh, sure, that's no problem for me. This demon would be asked the question, do you believe in hell? Without question, I, he would say, I believe in hell. Do you believe in the judgment? Well, one day he knows he's going to be judged. But ask him this last question and you'll find a distinctive difference in his response. Ask the demons of hell today, Mr. Demon, are you willing to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord of your life? And you know what the demon will say? Absolutely not, because Satan... The devil, Beelzebub, is my Lord. You see, you can believe an awful lot of things, the very same things about the Bible that the demons believe, and the demons believe, and yet they shudder in their tracks, James says here, because they know they don't have real faith. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen and young people, real faith always will have compassion, not just confession. And real faith will always have in it real behavioral change in one's lifestyle and not mere belief. But there's a third thing I want you to see right quick. And that is a dead kind of faith will show itself many times in orthodoxy 
without obedience. Orthodoxy without obedience. Many are orthodox in their belief. But they do not necessarily believe, that they do not necessarily obey God. Now listen, faith, somebody has said, is not believing in spite of evidence. Obedience is obeying in spite of consequence. And how absolutely true I know that that is. You can believe a lot of different things. Hey, I want to tell you, you can believe in the Apostles' Creed. You know what the Apostles' Creed is? Listen to this. The Apostles' Creed, written many years ago in the history of Christianity, says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and, and suffered And buried, the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come in judgment to the quick and to the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the result uh, of uh, the resurrection of the body, and the life change and the life everlasting. Now listen. I've read that through the years, and I've studied that through the years. And in many ways, there's some, hey, it's, it, it's what you believe. It's what I believe. I don't believe in the church that gets us to heaven. I can tell you that. I believe it's faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And that's one of the changes I would make in it without question. But I'm telling you, you can believe all of those other things about God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and still die and go to hell just because you give mental belief to even the Apostles' Creed does not mean that you are a genuine Christian with genuine faith in Jesus Christ. You see, what James is saying here is that you can be as orthodox in believing things about God, and if there is not obedience in your heart to the Word of God and to the commands of God and to the guidance of God in your life, you are being so foolish. Obedience is the test. Obedience is the mark. Obedience is the authentication that you have been changed from your heart, the inside out, and obedience to the commands of the Lord Jesus in an attempt to live out every command of the Lord Jesus. You know, I once told my son Nathan uh, when he was a young teenager to empty the trash at the house. And he hit me with a heavy line. He said, Dad, I don't feel like it. Ah. I said, excuse me. He said, I don't feel like it. Now listen, young people, basically what he was saying was, Dad, as your instructions hit my frontal lobe and move through the cranial area, down my nervous system, out through the motor end plates that intersect with the muscular structure, there is no commitment, modus operandi, to cause my skeletal frame to enter into a trash-emptying mode. To which I responded, I can change the way you feel. Because my instruction for him to empty the trash had no connection with his desire to empty the trash. My instruction had to do with one thing and one thing only. Because I said so, because I am your dad and you are my kid. And when I say trash, you jump. He's a police officer now. I don't think I would do that. But guess what, folks? God is looking for people who, when he says jump, the only question they raise is how high and how far. He's looking for a group of people who will obey him simply because he gives a command. You have to understand something about God. He's not big on suggestions, but he's heavy on commands. He is always in the command mode. And he says, 
that he's looking for a group of people who when he says to do something, they are willing to do it. And he puts a high premium on that. You know why? Because that tells God that our faith in him is as sincere and genuine as can be when we obey what he tells us to do. Jesus said it like this. If you love me, you will obey me. And so obedience, not just the, to the command of being baptized, not just the command of being uh, joining a church. I mean, the Bible is replete with the commands and the principles that God expects you and me to live by. And if you don't have a desire, a great desire, an intensive drive in your heart to be obedient to God in every area of your life, I'm just telling you, real faith will always be accompanied by obedience to the Word of God. All right? That's what James is talking about when he talks about real, genuine faith. Faith that has compassion. Faith that has love. Faith that has obedience. And so I think right now is a good time for you and me to question ourselves and to ask ourselves, is our faith in Jesus real faith or false faith? Is it genuine faith or is it spurious, false faith? We all need to ask ourselves that and make sure that we're seeking to live by genuine faith. Let's bow together for prayer. Heads bowed and every eye closed just for a moment now. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation in just a moment and give you that opportunity to make your decision for Christ, a decision that has been laid upon your heart perhaps all week long in the midst of preparing for the revival, in the midst of having that revival, and now the opportunity is not over. The opportunity is still here for you. Repent of your sin, invite Christ into your life, make a commitment of your heart and life and soul to him. And as we stand and sing this hymn of invitation, in just a moment, we give you the opportunity to do that and to outwardly show your genuine faith by not being ashamed of the Lord Jesus, by taking a public stand for him. And if your faith is real and genuine in Jesus, it will show itself, evidence itself, prove itself, authenticate itself without any problem whatsoever. There are those who need to come moving their letters of membership. If you're a Christian, a Baptist, a member of some other church, and yet God wants you to be a part of Mount Olive Baptist Church. We want to be a, you to be a part. We want to be your pastor and your church family, and we want to encourage you. You come as God speaks to your heart. Now, I understand and I know that unless the Holy Spirit moves you, that you won't do that. So we're praying and asking the Holy Spirit right now, Lord, the Holy Spirit we are asking to move in the hearts of people, young people, children, adults, who need to take a stand for Jesus in their lives. We pray that to be so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us? Jacob will lead us. We'll sing together. Right now you come and take your stand for Christ. Well, thank you so much. Would you be seated for just another moment? 
And I want to take another two or three minutes and do something that I did not get a chance to do last Wednesday night uh, at the end of our revival and everything. I want to take a moment and I want to recognize and thank all of these people who served as our revival committee chairman in preparation for the revival, having led a lot of us to do a lot of different things. And I know they don't want this recognition, but I want to, I want to recognize them nonetheless. All right? I want to ask, and just remain standing if you will, do not clap until we get to the very end. Mary D. Sheldon was our Sunday school night, Sunday night emphasis. Mary D., stand up for us and just remain standing. Our men's pack of pew was uh, Robbie Kimbrew. Robbie, stand up for us. Just stay standing. Pack of pew women's night, Rhonda Lansdale. All right, Rhonda, would you stand please? Stand for your mom. Would you do that for us? How about that? Okay. And then uh, Wednesday night, youth night, was Joy Kaiser, our children's night. Thank you, Joy. And Drew Allen. Drew, stand, if you would, please, for our youth emphasis. Our meals, boy, we're really grateful for her, aren't we? Cindy Ford. Cindy, stand up. Thank you, Cindy, for what a great job you've done in all of, uh, all of that prayer. Our committee was Ernestine Brown. Ernestine, would you stand, please? And our ushers chairman was Larry Blaylock. And Monty, you don't have to stand, but we just know Monty was indispensable last week playing, playing the piano. And Bonnie, uh, Jacob's mother, was here and played the organ for us. Let's continue to thank the Lord for her. And then all of those people who operated the sound and the computer streaming. Okay, guys, stand up if you're up there and worked last week and anybody else who, who worked in those areas. Now, let's give all of these people a great big round of applause. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. What a, what a wonderful job. You can be seated. What a wonderful job you did. And we thank the Lord for uh, all of the extra effort and work. And we're just so grateful for all of them. Then I want to take one more minute and recognize one other person. And that's Brother Chester Chisholm. Brother Chester, come up here, would you please? I, uh, I don't know what led me to lead to ask Brother Chester, other than that he's just a great leader here in our church to be the revival chairman, all right? I mean, that's, that's, in other words, that's the big dog, all right? Because I merely sat down with him and went over with him instructions and things for this, that, and the other that we were going to do. And after that, I just sort of backed out. And this guy right here, deacon right here in your own church, he took over the whole project and made calls. I cannot tell you how many calls, how much time he spent in getting everything done and all these committees working together to make all of it do what it ended up doing before the week was over. And Chester operated on all of that and did all of that, and I'm just extra grateful. Give him a great big round of applause and say thank you, Brother Chester. And the one thing I want to give him this morning is, uh, out of my 40 years of being a pastor, I have put together a revival preparation manual, have shared it uh, pretty much with a lot of folks during the, the years, have used it at Harrisburg. If I was there 21 years, used it 21 times. And uh, this is the whole package, Brother Chester, all right? We did it with just a little package last week. That's right. This contains all of that with a lot of other ideas. And here's what my prayer is. That when you get a pastor, uh, he will come into a church that has a gentleman like Chester who's gone through a lot of this material, can pick out lots and lots of other things to do in future revivals, okay, in future revivals, a lot of other ideas, and I'm giving this to the church, but I'm really giving it to Brother Chester. We want him to be the chairman from this point on. Amen? <laughs> you you got to have somebody like that who is a gung-ho, let's-get-it-done kind of guy to do what uh, we ended up doing in terms of all the, the, the ramifications of revival preparation. And it uh, takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and you can see the difference that it makes and gets lots of people here and a lot of blessings to take place. Stand with me if you would. I hope that you'll be here. We don't know what the weather's going to do this afternoon, but listen, we're going to be back here at church. And I hope you'll be here tonight, regular time, 6.30. And we're going to be standing at the back. We have a couple guys at the back who will be taking the offering for our young gentleman who is going on a mission trip. We want to take care of that as well. And I trust that you'll give something as you can as you leave. That's what I've been talking about all morning long. I tell you, it's, it's confession, but more than confession, it's compassion. And you, this, I'm telling you, your, your church, this church is remarkable in loving and caring and meeting the needs of people. I've seen that in 16, 17 months. And I'm, uh, I'm just awed at your generosity and your love. Let's pray together, all right? 
Brother Billy Roberts, lead us in prayer, sir.